great. Thank you for coming today. Um, my name is Sayer, <coughs> and I'm the manager here at Fitness Sake. Uh, one of my hobbies is to do research on the therapeutic uh, oh, value yeah. of natural uh, substances in the treatment seven. of health conditions based on my own personal needs and then people in my family and customers who've come in and asked me to do research for them. Um, I just like to qualify uh, what I'm going to talk about today by saying that this is not medical advice and that's for information purposes only and that anyone who uses the information should probably consult a licensed uh, healthcare practitioner before making a decision. Um, but another part of it is just getting back down to the roots of how we end up with an epidemic of bone problems in our culture and how we could adjust and reduce the risk for those sorts of problems with making better dietary choices and looking at a lot of research that proves that in many ways natural substances are superior to uh, drugs in the treatment of illness, um, not just prevention. I'm drinking tea tonight because one of the things I found on Medline, which is a huge national treasure database of medical information, um, is that tea drinkers have stronger bones than those who don't drink tea, which normally implies they're drinking coffee, for instance, uh, or maybe soda pop. Um, and so really quickly to sort of introduce the idea tonight is that there are a number of factors involved in osteoporosis, for instance, that have to do with what types of foods we're consuming and acid forming foods or foods that contain actual phosphoric acid so let's look at beverages like soda pop will have a deleterious effect on our bones immediately when you consume an acidic food you're going to have to balance it out with alkaline minerals and in nature you have five alkaline minerals you have calcium magnesium uh, potassium you have silica and you have sodium and these things are best um, received through food because we all know there are certain risks associated with, say, um, sodium chloride, which is uh, processed sea salt. Uh, it's hypertensive, for instance. It makes you retain water. But sodium and celery is very different. It's an alkaline mineral that will help to balance out acidity. And um, coffee and uh, beverages like soda are great examples of substances that will almost immediately pull out from the alkaline mineral stores in our bone so that we can neutralize the acidity. So that's one of the layers of the problem is the Western diet is highly acid forming. We fixate on grains which are invariably uh, acidic in reaction and we fixate on beans which are relatively high in protein for a vegetable and therefore actually because of the protein content are slightly acidic in order to break down protein Generally, we need to secrete hydrochloric acid, the parietal cells in our gut, so that we get a low enough pH so that protease will work to break down the protein. So protein-rich foods generally induce an acidic reaction on the most basic level of digestion, but then our tissues themselves may end up getting slightly acidic. And then we have meats, obviously, which in and of themselves are probably very good for us, assuming we don't have moral issues there. Uh, there has been some debate because when you eat a protein-rich diet, eating, let's say, a lot of red meat, uh, it's known that urinary calcium levels go up high. So we're losing calcium from our bones when we're consuming really rich, dense protein sources. But most of the meat in our country is corn-fed, so we're getting a lot of pro-inflammatory fats, which may be contributing to that, um, that calcium loss. So grass-fed meats, for example, would potentially be more beneficial. And there is research now showing that a protein supplement with those who have osteoporosis in combination with traditional bisphosphonate therapies, similar to like Fosamax, um, actually have significant um, beneficial effects in bone density. So protein is very important when it comes to having strong and healthy bones. And that's primarily because our bone starts off as collagen. The osteoblast will lay down a matrix of collagen and only later will it be mineralized. So really when you look at embryonic bone, it's really protein. Uh, proline is one of the amino acids that is uh, essential for producing collagen type 1. And that's basically where our bones are formed from. So protein sources that are not from grains, not from beans, not from, let's say, corn or grain-fed meats become pretty important. Um, 
So an acidic diet would include things like coffee and would consider any over-the-counter prescribed drug, generally pretty acidic in reaction. So that's one thing that we forget about, about a lot, but it's pretty basic to natural traditions is that there's alkalinizing foods, which are fruits and vegetables, and then you have acid-forming ones, which are the ones that Westerners tend to fixate on. So we want to keep that in mind. But today's my goal really is to debunk and to demolish some of the myths that seem to prevail in our country regarding how do we treat and prevent bone loss or weak bones, porous bones, you know, or how do we deal with terms like osteopenia, which a lot of women and men today, over 50, seem to have almost as a matter of uh, you know, rite of passage. <laughs> and we want to get beyond certain myths, like for instance, is having really dense bone good for us? You know, I'm under the assumption that it is. That's why most people subject themselves to DEXA scans, which is dual x-ray uh, analysis of the density of the minerals in your bones. That scan is extremely misleading because the scale they're using, known as the T-score, looks at your bone density relative to someone who's bone, you know, someone who's about in their mid-20s. So the T-score is not age-mediated. That would be the Z-score. The T-score only looks at the density of your bones, say you're 55, relative to where they would be if you were your average 25-year-old. And that's not very helpful because we've aged, Naturally, you lose some of your bone density with time, and it's not um, a disease. But the way people now look at the words osteopenia is, oh, that means I have a bone disease, and I have to do something about it. So let's take lots of calcium supplements, um, which we're going to have to really look closely at that because it's scary what can happen to the type of calcium that we consume in supplement form. It can end up in some really bad places which is one reason why we're going to look at bone density, increasing your high bone density, increasing your risk of breast cancer. Um, I just want to cover that real quick so we can get beyond the concept that the goal for strong bones is to have dense bones. This is the Journal of American Medicine, and this was in 1996, and it was a study involving 6,800 participants who were 65 years of age. Um, and what they showed was that those women uh, who had, let's say, the highest bone density, so 25th top percentile. So they had 2 to 2.5 times increased risk of breast cancer compared with women below the 25th percentile. And so, in essence, they concluded that the risk of breast cancer was 30 to 50 percent higher per one standard deviation increase in bone mineral density. And this whole standard deviation thing is how they determine if you have osteopenia or osteoporosis. If you're deviating 1 to 2.49 well, uh, points from a 25-year-old woman or, or male, then you have what they call osteopenia. If your bone density is minus 2.5 or greater, then you have osteoporosis. So they're saying the opposite for breast cancer is true, is that the less dense bone you have, the less likely you are to develop breast cancer. Now, I don't know they've done studies for men, but there is a correlation here that uh, needs to be explored because for men, there's a lot of research showing that calcium consumption increases the risk of prostate cancer. And this is something that I'm real concerned about for women because when you look at the x-ray mammography tool, you know, we're dealing with similar technologies. There, they're looking at density, and they're also looking for calcium, and that's one of the things that happens with the x-rays, is you see your skeleton reflected back to you. Well, when you have breast cancers, a good portion, most of them, you see calcium deposits. Now, there's a benign form called calcium oxalate, and it may still participate in carcinogenesis, but there is a very bad form called hydroxypatite, which is basically little needle-like uh, crystallizations, uh, technically calcium phosphorus, it's found in the bone, but they actually, it actually starts accumulating in the breast. And that form of calcium 